SEP Fanfic Readings Presents A Thousand Words by Olive Juice 28 Chapter 59 Introductions Draco was positive his heart was going to give out from beating so fast. He thought he'd been nervous the day of his trial, but that felt like a picnic compared to the physical torment he was currently enduring. His palms were clammy, his hands were shaking, his pulse was pounding in his ears with a deafening and too quick rhythm. His throat felt like it was closing up, and his tongue two sizes too large for his chokingly dry mouth. He hid all of this, of course, by stuffing his hands in his pockets and forcing a mask of calm politeness onto his aristocratic face as he walked beside Harry down the path to the village. It was Thursday morning, the day before the graduation ceremony was to take place, and Hermione thought he was meeting with Professor Weasley, who had been asked to stay in his office until the younger wizards returned, with the promise of an explanation at the time while she helped with preparations for the reception that would be held the following afternoon. In actuality, he was mere minutes away from being introduced to his girlfriend's parents, and, regardless of how many times Potter had told him not to worry, he was beside himself with doubt and misgivings. What if they hate me? What if they blame me? What if they've seen those memories of how horrible I was to her, how miserable I made her? What if they hold my family's position during the war against me? What if... "'You're doing it again, mate,' Harry's voice drew him out of his downward spiral. "'Get out of your head, yeah?' Draco nodded jerkily, unsure if he could speak without vomiting, and simply continued stalking toward Hogsmeade. As the pair reached the main street, Harry stopped and clapped a hand on Draco's shoulder, forcing the pale blonde to halt as well. He remained silent until the slate-gray eyes reluctantly met his own emerald-green ones. For as calm and collected as the rest of the former Slytherin's face appeared— Harry could clearly see the anxiety swirling in his silver gaze. "'I have never lied to you, Malfoy, have I?' Harry asked him sternly, and Draco shook his head. "'I've never led you astray, or left you to fend for yourself this year either, right?' Again, Draco shook his head, his jaw tightly clenched. "'Then trust me when I tell you that this is all going to be fine. They are excited to meet you. They appreciate all you've done to help bring this about.' and they simply want to thank you in person, before we figure out a plan for Hermione. Draco nodded and inhaled a huge amount of air before letting it out very slowly. He bounced a little on the balls of his feet, and took his hands out of his pockets to shake some of the nervous energy out of them. "'You good, then?' Harry asked. "'I'm good,' Draco said with more confidence than he felt, although he was much more in control of himself than he had been mere seconds before. With a nod of his head, Harry started off again, Draco beside him, as they made their way to the Three Broomsticks, where Alcott and the Grangers were staying. Harry had booked a larger suite for Hermione's parents, knowing it would be more private place to meet than the other spaces downstairs. Alcott's room was right next door, should they need him for anything. The two wizards nodded in greeting to Madame Rosemurda as they headed towards the stairs, and before Draco could gather his wits about him, Harry was knocking on a door that was immediately opened by a man he recognized as Hermione's father. Harry! Edward smiled broadly and extended his hand in greeting, which the raven-haired wizard shook before moving further into the room. He then turned his attention to Draco, who felt as if his feet had turned to lead, and studied him for a moment. Instead of offering his hand in welcome, he threw his arms around the tall young man and gave him a hug that rivaled one from Molly Weasley. Draco was stunned, but recovered enough to tentatively return the gesture, awkwardly patting the older man on the back. Edward heaved a deep breath and pulled away keeping his hands on Draco's shoulders, pinning him in place as he studied him with deep brown eyes, so very much like his daughter's. "'Son, I can't even begin to tell you how much we appreciate everything you've done.' His eyes were bright and his voice thick with emotion. "'If it weren't for your idea—' He trailed off and looked over his shoulder to where his wife stood, her arm looped through Harry's, her own eyes filled with tears. She took several steps towards the two men, and Edward shifted, lowering his hands as she came to his side. "'Thank you so much, Draco,' she said softly, reaching her hand up to cup his cheek. All he could do was nod as he became unexpectedly overwhelmed with emotion himself. She seemed to understand this and pulled him into a slightly gentler embrace than her husband had, words seeming to have escaped all of them at the moment. When she stepped back, she waved her hand towards a small table where tea had been laid out. "'Please, join us for a bit.' It was only as Draco made his way across the room that he noticed an older gentleman standing off to the side, with a friendly smile on his wrinkled face. He headed straight for him, his hand outstretched in greeting. "'You must be Alcott,' 
he said as he grasped the elderly wizard's hand in a firm grip and shook it. I'm so pleased to meet you. As I am to meet you, dear boy, Alcott beamed at him. I couldn't be happier with the way things have turned out. He steered Draco back towards the table where the Grangers and Harry were now seated, and the two of them took the remaining chairs as Jeanette began pouring tea for everyone. "'I'm sure you have some questions,' Draco addressed Hermione's parents, feeling much more at ease now that the initial introductions had been made, and it was clear they didn't hate him. "'Oh, yes,' replied Jeanette. "'But before we jump down that rabbit hole, we just wanted to tell you how very impressed we were with the memory you created for us.' She smiled warmly at Draco, and he could see so much of Hermione in her features and expression, it caused his heart to lurch. "'Yes,' Edward cleared his throat. "'That was very nice of you.' and I'm sure it took quite a bit of courage to put yourself out there in such a way. He cocked an eyebrow in question as he studied the young man across from him. Courting is quite serious, isn't it? Oh, so we're jumping right in on that, are we? Draco was a bit surprised, but he figured it was only natural for a young woman's father to be concerned about his daughter being seriously involved with someone, and even more so under these circumstances. He felt his cheeks began to heat up, but Hermione's mother came to his rescue before he had to come up with a response. "'Oh, Ed, stop it,' Jeanette admonished, smacking him lightly on the arm. "'I told him not to give you a third degree right off, but he just can't help himself.' She rolled her eyes and gave a small laugh. "'He's always been incredibly protective of Hermione, and this is rather new territory for him, since the only boy she ever really mentioned caring for in that way was Ronald.' Her eyes widened for a moment, and her gaze darted between Harry, who was trying to memorize the pattern of the teacup in front of him and Draco, whose mouth had formed a very thin line— it wasn't as if there was any ill will between the former rivals any more, but it's never comfortable to discuss old flames with your girlfriend's parents, and the boy Wonder found any topic of a personal nature to be completely discomforting. Draco decided to grab the Thestral by the wings, so to speak, and put an end to the awkward silence. Hermione and Ron are still very good friends, he explained, making sure his tone was light and his facial expression more relaxed. They just decided they weren't as good a fit as a couple— at least, that's how I understand it. Would you agree, Potter? Draco wasn't about to sail this ship alone, and turned a beady eye on his silent partner, whose cheeks were brightly pink as he stammered out a response. Um, yes, they're better as friends. He nodded and gave them a small shudder, as if he thought of them as anything more was simply awful, before grinning at the Grangers. It all worked out rather nicely. Ron's dating another schoolmate of ours, and Hermione's done a remarkable job turning Malfoy into someone you could almost describe as pleasant. He ducked just as a pale hand shot out to slap him on the back of the head, but both of them laughed and the three adults at the table joined in. "'When will you be coming up to the castle?' Draco asked. "'Tomorrow, I believe.' Jeanette looked at Alcott, who nodded in agreement, and then began explaining his plan for them and the reasoning behind it. Simply put, they all wanted Hermione to be able to enjoy the commencement exercises, since she had worked so hard and had achieved so much. They didn't want to overwhelm her before she'd had a chance to participate in such an important event, and figured it would be best to watch the ceremony, and then approach her. The small group discussed various ways in which to carry out this idea, and after a little over an hour of a conversation, which had included several amusing stories about the witch of the moment, they were all in one accord about the timeline for the next day. Draco needed to get back to the castle, so he and Harry began making their way to the hall after he allowed himself to be hugged by Jeanette, then Edward— then Jeanette again, then having his hands wrung by Alcott one more time before finally getting through the door. Once outside the three broomsticks, he allowed himself a gigantic sigh of relief and an exhausted chuckle. "'See? I told you it wouldn't be so bad,' Harry chided him. "'Yeah, yeah, St. Potter was right again,' Draco groaned dramatically as they trudged back towards the school. A thought had been niggling at the back of his brain since about halfway through their time with the Grangers, and he decided to voice it. Do they know about my sentencing? About my family's involvement in the war? About... everything? He knew Harry would understand what he was asking without needing further explanation. Harry shrugged. Yes and no. They do remember Hermione complaining about you from her earlier years when you were being a complete tosser and insufferable. But Draco cut him off. "'Yes, thank you. I know I was an arse. Get on with it,' he grumbled petulantly. Harry snorted before continuing. "'They know your family sided with Voldemort, and they know you had no choice in the matter. I gave them copies of the Daily Prophet that covered your trial, as well as your mother's and father's, so they have a basic idea of all that went on.' He paused, and his voice took a more serious tone. "'They don't know the specifics about the majority of our time on the run, 
or the day we were brought to the manor, or the actual battle. They simply know it was a very dangerous time, and that you have done more than enough to prove you regret your part in any of it, and that you're a different man, a better man, now. Draco nodded, thankful for the tactful way his friend had handled everything, and appreciating the vote of confidence more than he could say. I'm sure they'll have questions as time goes on, and they hear more from Hermione, he mused. But hopefully they'll know me well enough by then to believe I've completely denounced all of it. By all of it, he didn't simply mean the blood prejudice, but also the self-centered and arrogant attitude he'd had, the cruel and hurtful way he'd treated others, and the importance he'd placed on superficial and pointless things. When he looked back on the person he'd been before, he felt almost as if he was seeing a complete stranger, one he hoped to never encounter again. They reached the entrance hall, and Harry accompanied him back to Bill's office, where Draco settled in to tell his defense teacher what all exactly was going on, and Harry went to find the headmistress to do the same thing. He figured it was only right to inform her about the three extra guests that would be attending the festivities, especially since he expected their presence to cause a bit of a stir once Hermione found out. As the boy who lived strolled through the halls of his beloved school, he couldn't help the smile that crept across his face as he imagined his best friend's reaction. He knew Draco viewed this as a way to express his gratitude for all she'd done for him over the past ten months, and he echoed that sentiment tenfold. He was well aware of the fact that he probably would not be alive today if it wasn't for the brilliant witch he thought of as his sister, and he couldn't be more pleased with the way things had worked out, or the fact that he got to play a small part in bringing her to this happiness.